Welcome everybody this evening to an evening gathering of Lebanon Baptist Church. We're so glad that you are here. Uh, welcome. Uh, I walked in tonight and I was like, I was getting ready to come over here and I was like, man, I'm playing softball. I wasn't here last summer for these summer events. I was like, okay, what should I wear? And, and so I, I got all dressed and then I saw David, he's leading music and he, he was like me when I pulled in because he was helping put some tables. Then they got, he put this nice shirt on. I'm like, I'm, not, I'm gonna be so underdressed. And then, and then Sam walks in who's speaking and he looks awesome. And I'm like, here I am. I got my flip flops on at least. Sandals, at least Jesus wore sandals. So I was, uh, uh, and then I do have a, a Christian shirt on. It's a theology shirt. It's a, for a theological institution. So I was glad I at least could wear that tonight. But uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, tonight is the first of a series of six weeks in which we are gathering in the evening for a focus on the Word of God. Uh, we're going to be studying the book of 1 John chapter 4. And uh, I'm excited about the opportunity just to have time to come back together in the evening and also a time for fellowship. Kind of the plan is this. We're going to uh, uh, spend a little time singing. Uh, we will uh, have a special introductory uh, a video in, in a few minutes about this study. And then uh, Sam Adams, one of the uh, members of our church is going to be uh, talking about the first section of this uh, chapter of first uh, John four. And so I trust it will be a huge encouragement to you. Uh, just so you're aware in reference to the schedule, we're meeting six weeks, but it really is in seven weeks time. Next Sunday is the only Sunday we will not have an evening service during this next series. So next week, because it's the night before the 4th of July, many people are out of town. We're gonna take one break and then we'll be back at it the following week and trust you will be encouraged as we hear God's word from different uh, gentlemen within our congregation. Uh, announcement wise, just a reminder again this morning, we let you know about our summer of service. Lots of things going on in reference to that. There's a car wash. Uh, there's foster care ministry where we're going to be working on uh, some foster parents home uh, on July the 9th. If you want to talk to Danae Marinelli in reference to that. Uh, also, uh, VBS, uh, they may need some more volunteers. And so if you're interested in helping with Vacation Bible School and then parents, make sure you sign your kid up for uh, this special uh, opportunity. And uh Trust uh, you get involved this summer. There's, uh, I know a lot of you are going, going different places during the summer, trying to get in trips before kids uh, start school again. But trust you'll be able to jump in and get involved as as ab as you're able to. Uh, tonight, uh, uh, as you can maybe tell, we may need some of your help. Really, almost all of our staff is gone. Okay. Uh, Paul Sager, many of you know we uh, voted uh, Paul in as one of our pastors. P Paul and I, unless Pastor Hester's, there's Pastor Hester. Pastor Hester, Paul, and me are the three pastors who are in town. All the other ones are gone right now. You may not know this, but Pastor Mark flew out this afternoon. He is speaking at a camp in Alaska. Okay, and so he uh, is at a camp, and then he's at another camp the following week speaking. Uh, Two, uh, of course, a lot of our staff is out in Utah. They get back tomorrow. And so that is why the office is closed tomorrow because I am the only one standing when it comes to uh, uh, church tomorrow and I'm taking the junior high kids on a tubing trip tomorrow. I kind of like to do this every once in a while. I got one of my kids in seventh grade right now. So the office is closed tomorrow. Pray for our staff as they're kind of spread out right now. and. Uh, uh, trust, uh, uh, I trust uh, one other thing in reference to this week. Many of you are aware that uh, Maxine Carlisle, she was, I believe, our eldest member, uh, went to be with the Lord this past week. And her funeral is this coming Saturday at 11 o'clock. So you be praying for us as we uh, prepare for that later this week. All right, I'm going to pray. And then David's going to come and lead us in a couple of songs. After that, we'll, uh, we'll have another little uh, video, and then Sam is going to come and open God's word for us. Join me as I open with prayer. 
Father, um, I thank you for an opportunity to hear your word tonight. I am, uh, I anticipate, Father, as you give us your word through Sam, that, Father, you would soften all of our hearts, and would you allow your word to be implanted in us this, this evening, and would you allow us to grow as a result of it? Um, Father, I ask that tonight, as as newborn babes, that we would desire the sincere mil milk of the word that we may grow thereby. Would you uh, fill Sam with your spirit? Would you use him this evening? And then uh, I ask that you would bless our time of fellowship, our time of prayer, and uh, guide all of this this evening, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. David. Well, good evening. Let's stand together and sing. A church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. Let's worship God together. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. He is a new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her and for singing tonight we start our series in first john and in john chapter first john chapter 5 the author tells us the purpose of his writing he says it's so that you may know and be confident that you have eternal life he wants his listeners to be confident that their faith is actually real and as we go through this series we're going to find that john tells us that the object of our faith determines the nature of our faith and of course, John says the object of our faith is the person and the work and the correct confession of Jesus Christ. Let's sing together, my faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. Let's sing together about the object of our faith. Let's sing together. My faith has found a resting place, not in
singing Have a Seat. Like Pastor Brian said, uh, Pastor Mark is midway to Alaska, so he cannot introduce the book in person to us, but he was kind enough to prepare a video for us. So as we listen to, uh, tonight, we'll start with a video of Mark introducing First John. Hey everybody, and welcome to the first session of our study through 1 John chapter 4. We are really excited about getting into this study together tonight. Pastor Josh and I have had the privilege of meeting together with several men on Thursday mornings at 6.30 at a Starbucks in Milton, and we have been pouring over for the past several weeks the book of 1 John with a special emphasis on chapter four. And we're excited to share with you what we have learned as a group. And throughout the course of this summer, several different men are going to be getting up on Sunday nights and sharing with you a portion of First John chapter four. Tonight, Sam Adams is going to be opening up the first few verses to us. First, I'd like to share with you a little bit of the context of First John so that you know where chapter four fits into the rest of John's message. Message. A little bit of history for you. First John was written by, you guessed it, John. John was one of the apostles of Jesus. He was an eyewitness of Jesus's life and ministry, his miracles and his teaching. And in the opening of 1 John chapter 1, John wants to make it clear what he has seen and heard and experienced in his relationship with Jesus, he is going to share and proclaim to us. Because one of the things that John is most concerned about is he wants us who are believers living 2,000 plus years away from Jesus, he wants us to be sure that our faith is the same faith that he and the other apostles had. Now, John was writing probably to a group of churches around the city of Ephesus where John was ministering at the time. He wrote three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Now, there's something unique that kind of ties all of these epistles together, and it's really important to understanding the message of 1st John. The thing that ties all of the epistles together is this idea of false teaching. Apparently, the early church was being plagued by false teaching, and this false teaching was not coming from without side of the church, it was actually coming from within. People were beginning to depart from the faith those who were faithful church members, you could say, began changing their beliefs about who the person of Jesus was. In addition to their beliefs changing, their conduct also was changed. It wasn't lining up with Christian Orthodox living, life that is marked by walking in the light, walking in the truth and the commandments of Jesus, life that is marked by love for the brothers. And so people from within the church began to change their beliefs about Jesus. Their conduct was way out of step with what it meant to be a Christian. And to add insult to injury, these people were leaving the church by the droves, and they were going out into the world. And John says in chapter four that the world began listening to their message, the false teacher's message. So you can imagine how upset and really in turmoil these early church believers were. I mean, imagine you probably have several key friendships here at Lebanon. Imagine your group of friends being split apart, people that you loved and ministered to and laughed with and shared life with, all of a sudden rejecting the claims of Jesus and the gospel. All of a sudden, their life begins to reflect more worldly values. They're not keeping the commandments of Christ. 
They're living for this world that is passing away. And even for us as believers today, we are surrounded by this. And in fact, I think it could be even worse because of the advancement of technology, false teaching is at your fingertips. It bombards you as you go on social media and you interact with other people. And false teaching has become so prevalent, it's important for us as believers to know what is the truth and what is error. And the great thing is John wants you to know that too. In fact, in chapter 5, John tells us explicitly, I am writing these things to you so that you may know you have eternal life. Brothers and sisters, John wants us to be confident that the faith we're believing is the correct faith. And he wants us to be confident that the life that we are living is marked by Christian virtues of obedience to Christ's command and love for one another. Now, there are three themes that go throughout this book that I think are important for you to understand. Number one is the theme of Jesus and who Jesus is. John wants you to know that Jesus is the eternal divine Son of God in human flesh the Messiah who has come to save the world. John says Jesus is the propitiation of God's wrath. He's the perfect sacrifice that turns away God's wrath and cleanses the hearts of all who would put their faith and trust in him. And so the first theme is a right confession about Jesus. We need to get that right. The second thing is a right confession about sin. Really, John wants to know, what is the believer's viewpoint about sin? Now, John makes it clear, we all are sinners and even believers sin. In fact, in chapter two, he says, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So to be clear, we're all sinners and we're going to fail and we're going to fall and sin. But John says there's something really unique about a believer's attitude towards sin. A true believer cannot continue in unrepentant sin. A true believer cannot continue practicing sin in an unrepentant way. True believers who have the life of God in them are uncomfortable with sin. True believers at the end of the day would say this, they hate sin and they don't want it to be a part of their lives. And so what a believer says about sin and how a believer acts, their manner of living, are they living in obedience to the Lord's commands or in perpetual unrepentant disobedience? So first theme is who is Jesus? Second theme is really what does, how does, a, what does a believer say about sin and what is their attitude towards sin? The third theme is really about the believer's conduct. And it's really around this question about how does the believer treat other people? Those who have been impacted by God's transforming love, we love him because he first loved us. In this is love, not that we loved him, but that he first loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Somebody who has been impacted with God's love and transformed by the, the loving sacrificial work of Jesus is going to be a person who loves other people. You see, you can't say you love God whom you haven't seen while hating your brother whom you have seen. And those who love God, John says, ought to love his children. So these three things, 
What does a person say about Jesus? What is their confession? Number two, how does a person live? What is their attitude towards sin specifically? Are they living in unrepentant sin or they are they a person who wants and desires and whose life goal is to walk in the light? And then thirdly, are they a person whose life is marked by love? And so all of these things are really tests for you and I to know do we have the right truth and are we walking in it? And whether you're a young Christian or you're an old, older Christian in the faith, you need the message of 1 John. And I'll tell you, if you let 1 John, this message of 1 John wash over you, if you let it convict you, if you let it confront you and make you feel uncomfortable, if you wrestle with these truths and you hold on to a right confession and your desire to please the Lord, then you're going to come out of this more confident in your salvation. You're going to see God's work at work in your life. And those who have this kind of proper confession and proper conduct, John says they can stand before God without shame and without fear and without guilt because they are obeying Jesus's primary commands, which are, John says, to believe on Jesus and to walk in love. Now, I would like to encourage you, before I hand it over to Sam, I'd like to encourage you to read through the book of 1 John several times. Study the book of 1 John several times. Dig into it with us so that when these men come to preach, you're ready and already soaking up the scripture. I'm telling you, it's going to be beneficial to you. It has been super beneficial to me. I have been confronted by this book and it's a really great thing. I've been encouraged by this book and I'm sure you will be too. Well, at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Sam and he's gonna start unpacking the first few verses of 1 John chapter four. My apologies for overdressing. <laughs> I should have seen softball and known better. But, uh, all right, so you, can you believe we get to talk about eternal life tonight? Let that soak in a little bit. And if you would, um, go, go with me to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us. Holy Father, we are thankful for your word. Just thinking about the preciousness of what we get to talk about, Lord. There's so much confusion in the world, as we'll think about a little bit tonight. Lord, the fact that we can have gospel clarity put in front of us, Lord, we need your help. Um, as Pastor Brian mentioned, Lord, we need your spirit to have those kind of ears that actually listen to what we're hearing. At the end of the day, we, we want you glorified, Lord, because we know that we can't hear, can't do anything apart from your glory, and it all goes back to you. So please help us, Lord. Amen. All right, so as we start, if you would go ahead and turn to our text today, 1 John 4, verses 1 through 6. So we talk about love grounded in the truth. I'll make sure we're going here. All right, so... Mark introduced some of the struggles that the early church was having in the first century, late in the first century. This is one of the very last books we think that was written in the Bible. Um, John knew that there were spirits in the world speaking through false prophets that wanted to lead people away from the true church. And he was addressing that. He speaks to that in 1 John 4, verse 1. Where it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. So that warning we see in, in, in verse 1, we have to remember, was not just for John and the early church. It's for us today. And in fact, um, Mark alluded to the fact that because of what we have with technology, it seems even easier to spread false messages everywhere we go. And 
there's a lot of messages that are wrong that are being delivered in this world. And I've spent this month just looking at different messages and just paying attention to what I'm being told. Social media, um, news, there's a lot of news articles that I can't believe. Uh, and there's commercials tell me what I'm supposed to love, what I'm supposed to buy. You see it all through that. There's no shortage of people telling us what we're supposed to think, what we're supposed to believe, what we should do, how we should spend our money, all those things. Um, sometimes falsehood is not real obvious. Sometimes it's veiled in truth. And it doesn't get real easy at times to understand what's true and what's a lie because the lie sometimes is packaged like truth. Just a week ago, I met a man in a park. It was a Jehovah's Witness. And he let me know that there's no such thing as hell that there is a heaven, but it's already full. And, but I still had a chance to live on earth forever with my family. Now, obviously uh, there's a lot of alarm bells that go that are uh, not biblical. And he and I had a conversation about that, but I was just amazed at how many messages are coming my way and what I'm supposed to think and believe. So that leaves us with a few questions, I would say. How in the world do we stay solidly in the truth? I almost have the question of, does it even matter if we stay in the truth? Do you think it matters? So our text that we're talking about today has a few things to say about that. And we're going to tackle them over the rest of our time. And we're going to continue that as we study this summer. And I hope you'll stay engaged with that. But let me get us started in that direction a little bit. So my wife and I recently had a chance to do a getaway to Woodstock, just a weekend getaway out to Woodstock. Has anybody ever been, to, been out there? Have you? Yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm surprised. I didn't think there'd be as many. But did you know that Woodstock is voted one of the most top 10 most beautiful small towns in America? I bet you didn't know that. It's, it's pretty, it's fairly easy to get to. It's about a two hour plane ride to Albany, New York. And then when you get there, you got about a two and a half hour car drive over. You didn't think I was talking about Woodstock, Georgia, did you? Why would I go on a weekend vacation to Woodstock, Georgia? That's my mailing address. Well, we were on the way there. We met another couple in the airport going the same direction. We were told them we were going there and uh, they got all excited and they started talking about how great the music festival was back in the 70s and even kind of started to give us directions. And we had to stop them and say, we're not actually going to Woodstock, New York. We're going to Woodstock, Vermont. Totally different place. So if you think about it, just that silly little example, some details are really important, right? I told you I was going to Woodstock. You thought you knew where I was going. We use the same name, totally different place. Some details are so important that if you miss them, you might not be talking about the same place. All right, let's, let's take a look at tonight's passage. Let's go ahead and read that and start in verse 2. We've already read verse 1. We'll read 2 through 6. Chapter 4, 2 through 6. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming, and now is already in the world. Little children, you are from God and overcome them, for he is in you is greater than he is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, and whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So as we walk through this passage, we're going to break it down a little bit, and we're going to talk about three tests on how we can know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. First test we're going to take a look at is how we can know the spirit of God. It's found in verse, verse 2. Let me read that once more. At least once more. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Now, one of the things that we see as we study through 1 John is John talks in a lot of big terms. I call it a loaded statement. There's a lot in there. He just said a simple phrase, and if we didn't pay attention, we might just gloss over and miss some things. But John's actually saying quite a bit. Now let's talk about what it means to confess, because... This isn't merely words. We know that when a lot of times when Jesus was on earth and he encountered demons, they would start saying, there's the son of God. They would start confessing who he is and he would quiet them down because he didn't want the testimony of demons. So saying that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, for example, just verbalizing it doesn't mean what this means. It's important to understand that this word confess means something like aligning one's, one's life with the truth that you just said. It's like a covenant or a commitment with what I said. 
it's much more than just using words and saying it. And we know that even false prophets, prophets can say the right things sometimes. But this is literally, the word really means I'm going to align my life with what I just said. So there's a lot of weight there. But he says, the one who confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. So when he has, says Jesus Christ, that's way more than a name. Christ is not Jesus' last name. That's a declaration of who he is. That's a declaration of his person, of his character. All of the promised promises in the Old Testament throughout the Old Testament are reflected in that statement. He's making a statement about him. You know, when I was when I was probably in grade school, you know, we'd be sitting in history class and we'd be studying along the American Revolution and we'd get around the 1776 Boston Tea Party and I would see my name in the history book. Now you've seen my name Sam Adams, right? My full name is actually Samuel Adams. So if you know your history, you know he was a historical guy. So I was a silly little kid and I would see my name and say, I'm in the history book. Look guys, look everybody, I'm in the history book. Were they actually talking about me? Of course not. They were talking about a specific person who instigated the Boston Tea Party. He signed the Declaration of Independence and his brother was the second president of the United States. They weren't talking about me and that was not meant to be interchangeable for whatever I wanted to be. That's vastly important because the name of Jesus can be used. It does not mean they're talking about the same person. That is absolutely important. And the great thing about John is we know that he didn't just write this book. He also wrote the Gospel of John. And he spent a lot of time in the Gospel of John helping us understand who Jesus is. And this starts in John chapter 1 when he says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. He was God. And then on down it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John's making a very strong statement about this. The thing I love about John is I've thought about him and his witness is, John may have had the best perspective of any person on earth as to who Jesus is and was. Um, a lot of those truth claims that I mentioned that I saw on social media and all that, the thing I noticed is a lot of them were baseless. They were not founded on anything other than what someone thinks. But John, we know he was one of the 12 disciples. We also know he was one of the three closest to Jesus. So he got to see things that almost nobody did, including the transfiguration. Um, we know that he also both wrote the book of Revelation as well. And so he saw some amazing, hard to describe and hard to explain things. But John also, he's the only one we really see recorded at the foot of the cross. And Jesus commissioned John to take care of his mother, Mary. So John even got an entirely different perspective. So when John tells us who Jesus is, I don't know of anybody who might have a better perspective than him of all that he got to see. So, and John goes on through his book and he says, there's a lot here about Jesus. And he gives us that detail. Um, so, but then he says, continue with verse two. He says, the one who, one who confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. You probably didn't miss that statement. He specifically says, Jesus has come in the flesh. So Around the first century time, kind of Mark mentioned, there was something called Gnosticism that was starting to bubble up. And they started to question if Jesus actually came. They started to say, well, maybe he didn't even die on the cross. Maybe his spirit left him and his body died and things like that. Well, that same type of thing has continued all throughout history. And you probably know some of those things where people question, was Jesus a, a good man? Was he really God? Was, did he really die on the cross? Did he really raise from the dead? Did all these different things? There's lots of questioning around who Jesus is. But John is specifically saying, no, Jesus Christ came in the flesh. I know it because I saw him die. I, saw, I know he was dead. I saw him after he was raised from the dead. This physically really happened. And he's drawing that out because he knows some of the heresies that are bubbling up that have continued throughout are questioning those very things. Um, so that's, that's kind of our first test there, much more than the last name. But let's move on to the test number two. How do we recognize the spirit of the Antichrist? So we see the, the first one was really about how do you know the truth a little bit. And there's more about that. But the second one is about how do we recognize the spirit of the Antichrist? When you hear Antichrist, you probably think of one of John's other books I just mentioned. You may think about the book of Revelation. Antichrist is a figure there that will come physically, it appears, and wage war um, with those around him. But John says the Antichrist is already in the world. 
And he's not just talking about, he's not saying there's a being that's already running around and we need to figure out who he is. He's saying the spirit of Antichrist is here. And so what he's saying about that is this spirit is anything that tries to distort or distract or disown the name of Christ. It is anti-Jesus. So you think about that, that means the spirit could be really nice, but it's against Christ. That same spirit is here. And it is, it is a demonic thing. Satan is against Christ and he's working through all sorts of things, including people. But let's look at a couple characteristics about this spirit though, that we need to keep in mind. First one I would say is a distortion of the gospel. And I just hit on it in verse two. Um, you know, we've been spending some time there, but you know, I read through verse two. Let me, let me add verse three here. I'm gonna, I wanna cover that back. Verse three says, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is already in the world. So this spirit, one of the things it does is it distorts the gospel. Sometimes that distortion is very blatant really twisted, really strange, but a lot of times it's packaged in the truth. I know, um, I think it was mentioned this morning, our youth is out in plan camp in Utah right now and, and finishing up their last day there. I was out with them last year and we were doing a tour of the LDS conference center there in Salt Lake. And we had some people giving us a tour. And as we're going through, there was a, a tract on the side or a, a brochure that was the Mormon plan of salvation. I thought, oh, this would be interesting. So I pick it up and I start reading it. There wasn't a lot that I really disagreed with on page one, this particular one. Page two, okay, wasn't a lot I really disagreed with. But once I got to page three is where they started to say, it's based on works. It's based on what you do. If you check these boxes, you got it. And that's to say nothing of other distortions. And if you've ever talked to Mormons in particular, a lot of times, the things you say on surface level won't be a lot of disagreement. They'll, they will agree with you everything on the name of Jesus. But until you start to go to the next level, you start to find, oh, we're not even talking about the same Jesus. A lot of times the truth sounds that way, but it can be even closer than another religion like that. One of the largest evangelical churches in the world will use the name of Christ, but they refuse to go any deeper about who he is. And by their own admission, they don't do that because they know if they start talking about who Jesus is, they might lose church members. And so they refuse to do that. Sometimes it's a lot closer home than we, to home than we even realize. So we know the spirit will distort the gospel, um, but also life that contradicts the gospel as a practice. We're going to dive into that and some of the other things. I don't want to steal from some of the other texts. So that's something to keep in mind, the false teacher, that life will distort it. But also, there won't be a confession of Jesus. You can, they may flat out deny Jesus, or they may not talk about him. One of the things about the work of the Holy Spirit we know is the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit's moving, leads people to Christ, leads people to him. And that's his purpose. That's what he does. And um, if someone is claiming to be a prophet from God, but they won't name the name of Christ, they won't talk about Christ, then we can't say that they're from God. All right, so let's, let's, let's move on to the third test. The question we have is, do the spirits listen to the truth? Let's take a look at verses five and six. I'm going to read those again. They speak, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So this, whoever knows God listens to us. We have the same thing that we saw back in verse 2 about confess. When he says listens, he's not merely saying get, it with your, get the audio sounds inside your head. That's not what he means. I think some of you probably know this if you have kids, if you've ever been telling your kids something and they heard it, but you know that they didn't listen. How do you know they didn't listen? Because they didn't do it. Um, this is the same thing. This is what I heard, putting it into action. That's what he means by listen here. Because anybody can hear the gospel, but how often does the gospel in this world not get past the ears? That's what we pray for. That's what I prayed for in the beginning, because I know that so we really need to, we need to be able to listen. But 
I would say second to that, verses 5 and 6, we really need to be careful how we listen. Well, I got those flipped around, but we need to be careful what we really want to hear. So here's the thing. Note what it says in verse 5. Who, what, is verse, who, what does verse 5 say about who listens to false prophets? It's the world listens to false prophets. So we might, believers might hear something that sounds really good and get sucked in for a moment. Kind of like I started telling you about Woodstock. You may not have known which one I was talking about. But after a while, it started to smell a little fishy, didn't it? Believers, we start to smell out the truth, especially according to how well we know it. But the world listens to the world because they want their ears tickled with what's being said. This happened in John chapter 6. Something else that John wrote. Uh, Jesus had just fed the 5,000. And then we know it was 5,000 men and there was a lot more women and children there. He fed thousands of people with just a few loaves of bread and fish. All of these people were following him as he went along. Thousands of people, many disciples. But the problem was Jesus knew they weren't following him for who he is and what he really had to offer. They wanted more food. They wanted him to do another miracle. That was great, Jesus. Just keep giving us food. Always give us this food, they said. So Jesus started to speak real truth to them. And he said, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of me will never be hungry. This is the bread of life. Whoever eats this bread. And the people said, this is a hard thing. Who can follow it? And it's so tragic because you have all these thousands of people and the Bible says that many people turned away from him and quit following him at that moment. That's the worldly response to the gospel. It's not what they're looking for. That's an important piece because if you think back to the church that, that Mark alluded to, they were maybe starting to wonder, wow, there's a lot of people leaving. Am I really in the truth? The amount of people following it does not always mean it's true. I think some of you said, well, of course it doesn't. That's right. There's a lot of things going on today I wouldn't follow that the crowd's following. But it's true. But we can get discouraged. Jesus turns to his disciples at that moment in verse 67, and he says, are you going to leave too? Do you want to leave as well? And Peter at this moment, he didn't understand fully what he was saying, but he says one of the most amazing things. He says, where would we go? You have the words of life. Let's pause just a moment and think about that because don't we want to see with those kind of eyes? So much so that even if the truth is hard or difficult to follow, that we say there's absolutely nowhere else I can really go because it's that true. Let's see, let's, let's strive to have that same confession. All right, so I started at the beginning with the whole question of, in this world of confusion, how can we know the truth? I want you to know that in this world of confusion, it is possible to know the truth because there is one in us who has overcome the world. And we see that in uh, verse 4, right in the middle where he says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who's in the world. So in just a few moments, Pastor Brian is going to come up and lead us in a time of prayer. But I want to leave us with a few things that we can consider here. The first thing I want to, and we can pray through these things as well, but first thing I want you to understand and encourage you is to get to know the characteristics of the gospel. You want to know how to smell out a counterfeit? It's becoming so familiar with the truth that nothing false can get past you because you know the truth so well. The way that federal agents, some of you probably know this, the way that federal agents train to spot counterfeit bills is not by studying counterfeit bills. Um, and this is an old thing I heard a long time, and I looked it up to make sure it's true, and it's actually true. They start by studying the real thing. And they know a real bill so well that a counterfeit is, doesn't hardly get past them because they say, oh, that doesn't look like the real thing. That's not the real thing. I think it's really important because there may be times when people consider the gospel as a basic thing you understand when you're a Christian, but I bet if you've been walking this very long, you know that, wow, I can just mind the depths of the gospel and I'll forget what I think I learned and I'll never get to the depths of it, who Jesus is, what he's done for me, who I am. 
good gracious, if we could just understand who we are, how much more dependent would we be on Christ? So I want to encourage you to do that. Get to know the characteristics of the gospel. But here's something we can also pray for tonight. Ask God to give you ears, ears to hear throughout this study. You know, I think, I, I just feel like this is so crucial because there are spirits in this world that want to lead us away from the truth, and they are not passive. I'm sure you can, we can all guess that when we think about the messages that I feel like that are coming at me. I don't have to do anything. All I have to do is turn something on, and I feel like those spirits are attacking me with falsehood. We need to ask God to help our keep our eyes fixed on the truth, ears hearing the truth, and so that we recognize it, so that we, we can be like this body that John's talking about who, when he says, people who are of God, when they hear what we're saying, they follow us. Uh, they don't do that because John's got it right. They just do it because John is speaking the truth because he has been shown the truth. And he said that in the beginning of the book. He said, the things we've seen and heard, we're telling you. And then, as well, we really have to trust God who helps us overcome. That's a simple thing, right? But if you look at it, he says, you have overcome. But why have you overcome? Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Um, there's something that's just about that desperate prayer to God that says, God, I really have nothing to offer. It's you. It's you, God. And that's what we have to do continually. Um, and and so when we're struggling, we look to him. Kind of has echoes of last summer's Sunday sermon, where, uh, Sunday night, night sermon series, where we talked about Hebrews 12 and we said, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. It's kind of, kind of the same vibe here because look to him. He's the author. He's the perfecter. And that's what believers do. So as we come up and pray, remember that story I told you at the beginning about Woodstock? innocent confusion. I just want to remind us that there is a spirit in this world that really wants to take us down, really wants to take the name of Christ down. So let's not be passive. Let's not be passive in our prayers. Um, and let's not be passive in our study of the word because it's really going to help us stay true. Brian, I'll turn it over to you. What a great start tonight of just diving into 1 John 4 and, uh, of course, the introduction by Mark and now this first step, I trust that now you will, let's start by praying that particular prayer that was just encouraged us. God, open my ears that I would grow in this and that I would grow in my understanding of the gospel and the God who began a good work in you is going to complete it, but he does want you to ask and uh, let's do that this evening. All right, what we're going to do here at the end, and on Sunday evenings over the course of the summer, we're going to have some singing, we're going to have uh, some preaching, and then we're going to have some prayer time, and then we're going to go have some food, okay, and have some fun outside. But uh, before we get to those last two parts, we want to pray for a few minutes. And so before we jump into prayer, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Some nights we'll do different things, but uh, tonight we're going to pray for ears to hear during this series. But I'm also going to give you an opportunity for just a moment. Maybe, uh, Ken, I did have a microphone. There was an extra microphone. Uh, maybe Jacob could run it around. Uh, if you have a particular request, maybe someone you're trying to reach with the gospel, uh, of course, let me ask that you pray for the 17 areas, uh, the area that you live in, that God would help our church to reach that area with the gospel. Um, I was talking to Crystal before the service in reference to our vacation Bible school. Uh, we already have, like they said, somewhere between 80 and 90 people already signed up. Uh, pray that God would greatly use us to herald the gospel to the young children in our community. So let's pray for vacation Bible school, ears to hear during the series, okay? These 17 areas, anyone else have a request that they would like for us to remember this evening? My son will run you a microphone and uh, we'll let you share it. Maybe someone you're trying to reach for the gospel. Anybody? All right, right over here to Patrick, Jacob. Okay, all right, Patrick, maybe just try to project as best you can. 
first. Okay. So uh, Carla and I just have some new neighbors that moved in. Um, we knew they were moving in, and uh, they moved in while we were on vacation. We've been praying for opportunities to uh, just uh, share a witness with witness to them. Um, they had an ordeal moving in. Their moving company said they're not going to deliver the stuff, so they had to go meet them and have everything brought in. So they posted a note on the subdivision Facebook page, asked people to come help. Carl and I were the only people that showed up. So um, we've had the opportunity to introduce ourselves, talk a little bit about church. So we are just looking for an opportunity. Um, they invited us over for dinner and drinks. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, we kind of know what we're dealing with, but um, we'll, we'll have uh, a good opportunity. Just pray that we have build a relationship with them. Let's pray for the Mueller's neighbors that God would allow them to have a door for the gospel's sake. All right, Patrick, here comes the microphone to you. Uh, as Pastor Brian referenced, uh, Maxine Carlisle passed away, um, but we wanted to lift up her daughter, Marlene, in yeah. prayer. Uh, why? Well, while Maxine was passing away, her son Denver was actually in surgery uh, for his liver. So he's very ill with stage four cirrhosis. Um, so Marlene is really for the last couple of years caring for both her mother and her son in the same house. So she's really been burning the candle at both ends. Uh, so I think I would like to pray for her that uh, she would have the peace and comfort that can only be provided by our Savior. That's great. Let's pray particularly for that. And let me encourage you, uh, uh, the Cahills uh, have been really trying to reach out to a number of our shut-ins with different ministry. And if you're interested in learning more, I'm sure they can give you some ideas of, hey, go visit this person, investigate this. But let's pray for Marlene and her family. I, I'm going to have a lot of time with them this week just because of the funeral coming up and opportunities to interact with their family and pray that uh, the gospel would go forth even through her uh, her funeral. Okay, any other requests tonight? All right, up here to Crystal Jacob. Uh, just be praying. We have 11 rising sixth graders going to seventh grade to our youth group. And so that is a huge, awesome group coming up. So just pray for sponsors uh, to just be wise and invest in them, but then also that these children will really grow in their faith. That's great. Let's pray for these rising, I mean, uh, rising seventh graders coming in. And uh, yeah, pray for me and my wife and I as we take them tubing tomorrow. Okay, pray for our safety with, uh, I've always said, you know, a junior hire's brain, you know this, right? It's divided into two lobes, junior hires. And I remember a, a junior high science teacher told me this, and I, ever since then, it's like, that is a junior hire's brain. So it says two lobes, one side is always saying this. What is the stupidest thing that I can do right now? And the other lobe is saying, do it, do it, do it. And uh, I still haven't left that face of life. But, uh, but anyway, pray for that group that God would just grip their hearts and that they want to live for the Lord and uh, pray for that. All right. Okay. Let's do this. Uh, tonight we, we, uh, we're going to just divide up into some small groups. Maybe if there's some people around you. Okay. So if you're by yourself, find, uh, go adopt somebody. Okay. Get into a group, maybe three or four and, uh, let's pray for a few of these requests. And then probably in about five to 10 minutes, I'm going to come back up and I'll start leading us in prayer and then give you some final uh, uh, instructions in reference to dinner and softball. Sound good? So let's go to pray right now. If you need help getting in a group, look, wave at me and I'll help you find a group. Okay. First John to deepen our faith in you and that we would, uh, we would grow in grace and in the knowledge of our, our Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray again for the Mueller's, help them to reach their neighbors, help all of us, Father, to have a heart to reach our neighborhoods for Christ. Lord, these 17 areas that are represented by our church congregation, help us to see people come to Christ through them. Father, use the gospel this week in the Carlisle family. Draw some of them into your family through this uh, funeral. 
And uh, Lord, now would you uh, bless this food to our bodies, bless our fellowship, keep us safe on the field. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as we're dismissed tonight, tonight okay, the food, okay, the food is...